Welcome. I'm uh, Sharon Ramey, and I am, I'm about promoting the abundant life for all people everywhere. I'm about celebrating and cheering for you and just being a sort of a midwife to encourage the abundant life among all of you, every one of you. I love to teach, and therefore, what I try to do is come up with some really easy and simple principles, spiritual principles that will encourage, that will foster, that will grow the abundant life in each of you. And so it tickles me when I can see myself as sort of a midwife for the abundant life for, for all people. And yesterday, I have to say, I did not feel that. Yesterday, I was getting ready to go out uh, for a, a fairly extended walk and leaving my house uh, because a walk is that time of, of day, the day before I'm going to do a talk where I get to just chat with God about, you know, what's the best, are there any other things that you want me to include? And what was interesting was just as I was about to leave the house, my neighbor, a uh, gentleman from next door, came over, running over, and he says, um, I have to talk to you. I said, okay. And he says, you know, because you read the listserv, that there's been a lot of crime in our neighborhood lately. I go, yeah, cars broken into, houses broken into, people with these little axes and stuff that are just chopping off door handles to get into houses. Um, car stolen. And I was like, <clears throat> yes, I read that. And he says, well, he says, yesterday, there was a gentleman that I knew didn't belong in, in this neighborhood. And he was down here, and it looked like he was scoping out houses. Like he was, and our property, the property that we live at, you, you enter kind of on the street, and, and then you have to come down a very private walkway past a triplex, and then past another house, and then on out to our house. So it's not the kind of place that a lot of people would be coming, because they don't want to do the 47 steps that it requires to get down there. So, so he was very upset, and what he wanted to talk about was the fact that this guy was probably scoping out the, um, the houses there for a theft, or he was probably going to bring people back later on, and there was going to be, you know, some sort of break-in. And we should let all of our, we should let the police know, and we should let all of the people in the community know to watch for this guy, because he could be dangerous. So we said goodbye, and I headed out on my, on my walk, and I felt sick. I just felt sick. I had brought into myself all of that fear and all of that, what if this guy is doing everything that my neighbor said? What if this guy is going to hurt somebody in our community? What if this guy is going to steal property? What if, what if, do you hear that? What if, just cycling down, down, down. And it occurred to me as I was out on my walk that that's one of the things that is so easy to do, it's so habitual. Something happens and we start this, oh my God, what if disaster's gonna happen? And I think Kathy Ann spoke about that a couple of weeks ago where she said, we, we pay attention to danger, even danger that's not actually visible right then. We, we have our antenna up because in prehistoric times, that's how we survived, right? We thought, okay, where's the danger and how can I protect myself from it? And so it seems like that's what we do these days is, we, is something happens, something that could be even innocent, and we're on guard. And we can get fearful. And that's where we need our spiritual grounding so that we don't go in that place. But... It's so easy. I mean, I've had years of spiritual grounding, and still, something it comes up with a diagnosis of cancer or something worse, and, and I get fearful. I get fearful for my friends. I get fearful for my family. 
And we start talking about, well, what if this can't be cured? And what if it's going to be painful? And what if, what if? Or I have uh, somebody near and dear to me that tells me of a relationship that's going bad. And they start talking about, well, you know, what if we separate? And what if we get divorced? And what if, what if, what if? It's all going to be horrible. And then somebody else may say, oh, my God, I think I'm going to get a pink slip on Monday. And what if I can't find another job? And what if I don't have enough money? And what if, what if, what if? Do you see how easy it is to go there? Thank God that we have, would all the practitioners please stand up? Thank God that we have prayer practitioners we can go to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank God that we have the spiritual grounding that we can go to so that we can start to do something else, go down a different path. Now, what would it be like? What would it be like if, um, hold on, what would it be like? (laughs) Okay, sorry. Oh, so before I go there, what ends up happening when we're doing this is we're, we're cycling down. But do you hear what's going on in your mind? You say, what if? I don't have enough money. What if what I want to do is hard? What if, when you pose those kinds of questions to your mind, your mind starts working on them imaginatively. Oh, thank you so much for this little puzzle and this little question I get to work on. Let's see, what if you don't have enough money? Hmm, we can sort of create something like that for you to experience. Anybody ever have that? Where you start ruminating on something and then all of a sudden you're in the middle of that experience that you feared? It's the way the mind works. You ask it what if, and it says, let's see what we can do in this regard. So if that's true, then how about if we think about using that what if question to go a different way? So, um, oh, here's my book. Mindy Odlin wrote a book called, What If It All Goes Right? Before the first service, there were a few copies in the bookstore, but it's a great book because she says, we talk so much about what if it all goes wrong? What if it all cycles down to disaster for us? But very rarely do we step out of that and say, what if it goes right? And guess what? Isn't that what prayer is about? What if this could be good? What if such and such could be easy? What if the, um, I had a, friend, a very good friend who got cancer, and she said, what about if I could go through chemotherapy and not get nausea? <gasps> I had another really good friend who, who went through uh, two divorces. And she started to go to that place about what's wrong with me. What if I can never find a partner? What if if this is what I'm doomed to? And then she stopped and said, what if this was just a prelude for the good relationship that's in store? What if I was meant to learn everything in these two relationships so that I could have a perfect relationship? What if something good? My daughter ended up losing um, her job one time. I was really upset. She wasn't as upset. I was really upset. I mean, I I wanted to call her boss and say, what? Yeah, I mean, I I don't mean to say I'm an overbearing mother, but I am. So, um, So anyway, she's like, mom, mom, just calm down. What if, even though she loved this job, it was a sales job, she had an expense account. Um, She said, what if this was just a prelude to what I'm supposed to be doing? And she ended up finding a better job that, that, uh, uh, I mean, not a better job, she started her own business. And she is now working with people who have eating disorders, helping them heal from that whole cycle of self-destruction. And she went back a year later to thank the person for letting her go. What if God's plan is like that? What if 
there is always something good. What if there is an order to this all where it is all going right? What if something good? I think one of my favorite stories in this book, I have to read it to you because uh, otherwise I might forget a detail or two. Okay, year 1887. I know you all remember that year. It was the year, 20 years after the Emancipation Proclamation where the slaves were freed, right? And of course, you all know that once the slaves were freed, there was never any more discrimination um, in, the, in the country, right? Right. So here's only 20 years later. Now listen to this. A 20-year-old African-American widow, widow, 20 years old, I want you to picture, with a two-year-old baby and a job working in the cotton fields of the Deep South, looks at racism and inequality that engulfs her daily experience. She's working in the cotton fields, 20 years old, baby, not married. She asked herself, what if she refused a life of poverty? Refused a life of poverty. What if she could acquire wealth and respect in this society? What if she could use her influence to blaze a trail for other women and African Americans who were subjected to daily discrimination? Are those a bunch of pretty impossible what ifs? This is yes. They were, I mean, come on, 20 years old, working in the cotton field, she's saying, what if I could reject poverty? What if I could be an influence for women and other African Americans? Yes, the first self-made mil female millionaire in America. Now, not the first made African American female millionaire, the first self-made female millionaire was Madam C.J. Walker, who began as an orphaned African-American single mom born to former slaves on a plantation in Louisiana. How dare us think that anything is impossible? How dare us? How dare us not turn to spirit and take our eyes up from our problems and the cycling down and take it up and say, what if we could be prosperous? What if whatever I'm trying to do could be easy? What if everything that is going on in my life is divine order? What if all is contributing to my highest good and the good, the highest good of everyone? What if? Now, remember, I told you how the brain works. It, it takes those what ifs and it starts chewing on them and forming them, right? And, and here's the thing I love about the what if up. When this lady was asking, what if I could reject a life of poverty? She did not say, she did not acknowledge her poverty and then in the same sentence say, I am prosperous, I am prosperous, I am prosperous. Because what is the mind going to tell her? Right. Have any of you ever had that experience? I have. And I feel like such a fraud at times because I'm trying to say, I am joyful, I am grateful, I am all of this stuff. And my mind is like, no, you're not. But one of the things I love, now this is just for me, and I'm not, I'm not saying that the other way isn't good. I'm just saying that this is a technique that I can use so that my mind doesn't re out and out reject whatever I'm telling it. What if I could be prosperous? What if I could be happy, even though right now I'm feeling depressed and I can't say, I can't say with any degree of, of truth, I am happy, I am happy. I can't say that. But I can say, what if in, if in the middle of this, what if I could be happy? What if things could be easy? What if there could be order in the midst of this chaos? What if there could be an abundant life for all? 
One of the things that I, I noticed when I was trying to get my, my head around this whole abundant life for all thing was that I wanted to be in that place of what if I could prosper outrageously and others could prosper too? Well, that was a little difficult for me because I grew up as a financial schizophrenic. And what I mean by that is that I had two grandparents that came in their teens. They didn't know each other. They came in their teens from Ireland and came over to the United States as immigrants and worked really hard. They had nothing. They were very poor. They had nothing. And they rose up to, she started out, my grandmother started out as a maid for the Rockefellers. And she thought, what if I could have that kind of class? What if I could have accessible money like that? My grandfather, who came over as just a, a worker, but he had an education, ended up being the secretary to the vice president of the United States. The two of them somehow got together and created a very prosperous life for themselves. They owned apartment buildings and, and property and, and all of this. And, and of course, their son, their firstborn son, had to be a surgeon, <coughs> right? Who happened to be my father. Then, here comes my mom, whose mother was, well, she never knew her dad really hardly at all because he left right when she was born. Her mother was only just barely made 17 by the time she was born and had this baby that that, and they had no money. She had to have her sister raise the baby. And so my mom grew up with really nothing, absolutely nothing. And so she decided that she would go to um, nursing school in Washington, D.C., where my dad lived. The two of them met, and oh my gosh, the difference in consciousness of the, the, the prosperity consciousness of the two was amazing. My dad had both the kind of rich and with, a, with a, an, an overtone of having been, of his ancestors having been poor. Mom had never had money, and the two of them came together. And we ended up somehow living in this mansion on the beach in Hawaii. But the mansion was in huge disrepair out of six bathrooms. At any one time, three of them didn't work. Why? Because we didn't have the money. Do, do you see how there was this non sequitur going on? And this is the family that I grew up in. Sometimes it felt like we were really rich and we had lots of money. And other times it feels like we had nothing. And, oh, my God, who's going to fix the bathroom? Has anybody ever had that kind of like double messages coming in? And, and, and we get double messages, not just from our ancestors, but from all of race consciousness. From all of race consciousness. So I'm, um, I just want to invite you to consider a different what if. What if we could all be prosperous? What if we all had, as Edwin Gaines says, money enough to do whatever we wanted to do and, and to give money as much as we wanted to? And um, what if we all had that kind of, those kinds of resources and at the same time, everyone else did too? Is that imagining too big for God? Could we maybe say, could we just play with what if? What if we could create that? What if God could create that only by us saying, what if this could be our possibility? Because remember, as that's happening, as we're saying, what if, all of a sudden, spirit is working on those words, and resources are being grabbed, people are being grabbed, all toward the end result of whatever we declare, what if. Now, I have to tell you a personal story because, as I told you, I grew up with all these mixed messages about money, and then I married Paul Ramey 
who has no problem with any of that. And so he was trying to tell me, he was trying to tell me that um, there is nothing that we can do with money that can't be a source of blessing in the world. Nothing, except bury it in the backyard. And I was like, what? <laughs> and he says, let me give you an example. How about if you spend money? It says like we just bought this new car. Is that just a selfish thing? He said, I don't believe it is. He said, I believe that when you buy a car, you are supporting the families of the people who, were the, who designed the car. You're supporting the families of the people who uh, sold the car. You're supporting the families of the people who manufactured the car. You're supporting of the families of the people who are going to take care of that car. Wow, you're right. He said, the problem is we're not conscious of it. We think by spending money, that's a bad thing because we should just give it away. But he says, actually, we're contributing to the prosperity of all people. I said, wow, that's, that's true. That, you're right, that's true. And he says, good, can I have a new boat? Then I said, yeah, but, you know, what about, like, saving, in an, as saving money, for example? I mean, you know, what about if you have more than you actually need to spend? Uh, and, and, and he says, well, think about it. Did, when we bought our, our house, did we pay cash for it? I said, no, we got a loan. When we bought this car, did we pay cash? No, we got a loan. When we um, opened the business, did we do it on our own money? No, we also got a loan. He said, we could not have done that except somebody somewhere had the foresight to put money in the bank that we could borrow. They had an excess of money, and they allowed us to borrow it. Is that not God? Well, yeah. <laughs> That's true. That's true. If nobody put any money in the, in the bank, I don't know about you, but we would never have gotten our first house, our first car. It would have taken us a long time to get anything. So praise God. And then finally, I said, yeah, but what about investing in corporations and stuff? He said, Sharon, first of all, you can invest in any corporation that you want. But if you choose to invest and buy stock in a corporation, um, he says, think about it. Every dollar you put in is, a, is an opportunity for them to hire more people. Every dollar you put in is an opportunity for them to um, create new products that would be good for the rest of the world. Every dollar that you put in stimulates creativity stimulates new growth among everyone. How can that be bad? Praise God. So Paul, in his own, in his own sweet way, was able to let me know that it's possible that as I prosper, all can prosper. And these are not the only examples, but what I want to tell you is that as I say that what if statement, what if as I prosper, all could prosper even more? As I say that, all of a sudden, I start seeing the evidence that that actually can happen. That actually can happen. So, what if... So, so what if is a way of tapping into your imagination? What, asking that what if question is a way for you to start creating a bigger reality, a more spirit-centered reality, a reality that works for everybody. So, as I was finishing up my walk, it occurred to me, that I could say, what if, about the guy that was on the property. I could say, what if, that didn't help me, didn't help my neighbors, and didn't help him. I could say, what if he was a thief? What if he was going to break into one of our houses? What if all of I could say all of that, and that would not be contributing to the abundant life of him 
by my accusing him. It would not be uh, uh, contributing to the abundant life of my neighbors because I'm holding this thought that they could be broken into. That wasn't helping. That wasn't contributing to the abundant life of anybody, least of all me. So I thought, what would help? How could I contribute? And what, can, what emerged was I could say, what if there was a perfectly good reason, a helpful reason for this gentleman being on the property? What if we were all safe? What if all, everybody in our whole community in the world was safe? What if there was never any reason for people to break in and steal and anything like that because we all were prosperous and engaged in creative, creative um, uh, ventures? What if that, what if I gave God that what if to work on? Did that feel like it contributed to the abundant life of my neighbors, of myself, and of this gentleman? Yes. So I encourage you to um, use this technique. What if something good? I encourage you to use it and see how it might work for you. When you're feeling like things are so chaotic, what if there was order in my life? When you're feeling like, like, oh my God, I have to go to work and it's going to be so hard today, what if this was going to be easy and I get an opportunity to contribute my highest good at work today? What if this center is ready to move and, and there are thoughts like, oh my God, we're never going to find a place as good as this. We're never going to have a, a place as good as this. What about if we, ne if we don't stay together? But what if we do? What if we have the most fabulous creation of Center for Spiritual Living Seattle that ever could be imagined because all of you were saying, what if that happened? Yeah. So... So I encourage you to use this technique. It is so simple. Whenever you're frustrated, angry, mad, um, fearful, whatever, take a moment to stop and say, what if God's got this covered? What if the highest good could be our reality? And so, you know, theories, I can stand up here and and teach and preach and give theories all day long, but unless you go out and use it, it is not going to contribute to our world being a better place. So I encourage you, this week, if you have no, nothing else you do, please try this what if. I don't care how big you try it, what big issue you try it on, or how small. Just try it and prove to yourself that you are living imaginatively and it's serving the world. So let's pray. Oh, in this moment, in this high and holy moment, I allow spirit to delve into my life, to, to dive into uh, to all of the situations of my life, the situations that can be fearful, the situations that can cause me anger, the situations that feel hard and difficult, the situations that feel, feel uh, chaotic. I invite spirit to come into all of those situations and allow a beautiful what if to rise up. A what if of a new tomorrow, a what if of a new possibility. A possibility that could include fulfillment, prosperity, peace, joy, good health for all of us. A possibility that is ripe with the Spirit of God because we, as we consider these possibilities, we move higher and higher in truth. Oh yeah. Things like illness, that is a truth, yeah. And things like job loss, that's a truth. But it's not the highest truth. The highest truth is what if there is a divine plan? What if there's divine good for in all of this? What if, what if, what if? And so in that holy, holy statement of what if, I just let God do its work. I speak the, the question, what if good? and allow spirit 
to transform it all into experience. And so, what if the words of God, what if we could be high and wholly blessed and not do anything? I give thanks for this. I call it good. I call it God. And so it is. Amen.